She, she was very specific recently saying that a mom, a poor mother who lost two kids to fentanyl, that, that I killed her sons. Well, the interesting thing is that fentanyl they took came during the last administration. <laughs> you can always count on President Joe to be oh so appropriate, but over 100,000 Americans died from drug overdose in 2021. That was up a staggering 15% from 2020 when ODs were already on the rise, due in part to the safer at home COVID protocols and of course, the illicit, illegal and deadly drugs pouring across our southern border. One of those illicit drugs often used to cut other drugs is fentanyl. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid that is 50 to 100 times stronger than morphine and becoming not only the new drug of choice, but also the new drug of almost certain death. And chances are it's a huge problem in your community, just as it is right here in Nashville, Tennessee. Joining me now with what you need to know is Darren Hobbs of Nashville Recovery Center. Darren, you and I sat down for a discussion with this in 2020 when mental health was a huge issue, overdose was a huge issue, addiction, depression, all of it. But even though the restrictions have been lifted with the pandemic, we're still here. We've still got a fentanyl crisis. We've got a drug overdose crisis. Mm -hmm. And it's bad, really, in every city across the country. But what are you seeing here in Nashville? So from small town America up to the Northeast and back to Nashville, what I'm seeing is that this is the most potent, the most addictive drug. Uh, I don't think we can truly trust CDC numbers because they, you know, given, given the COVID mm -hmm. representations, um, but what I'm seeing is you can buy a lethal dose for as little as $2. So a tenth of a gram of fentanyl powder, it can be enough to kill anyone on the right day. Um, so, so for $2, you can lose your life. We'll use a gram of sugar to illustrate what a gram of fentanyl would, would be represented by. So for $2 in most U.S. cities, you can buy baggies as small as a tenth of a gram for $1 to $2. There's two tenths separated. So in small baggies everywhere across America, this size package is being sold for one to two dollars and can absolutely kill your loved one. So for those that are not familiar, as I am not familiar with drug culture, really, to me when I hear about fentanyl is when I was at the southern border and it's like you don't want to touch that stuff, you don't want to be near it because it's deadly. Mm -hmm. So explain to me how people are trying to get their hands on something that is really a promise of almost certain death what does it do for them? What kind of high does that provide that they are willing to lose their life? I mean, it's not like other drugs. It's one of those drugs where you are really, really gambling. Explain to me how this all works. Sure. So addiction really begins with unwanted feelings. So how do I medicate unwanted feelings, right? So you take a casual user who just wants to get over a breakup or study a little bit harder or make sure that they are uh, on their P's and Q's for a work presentation, right? So you might be buying Adderall, or you might be buying a Xanax, or you might be looking for a Valium, um, or you have those normal folks that might party once in a while, right? Fentanyl is now found in every street drug and in every pharmaceutical pill that is available on the street. If it's not, if you don't see it coming out of a pharmacy bottle, you can guarantee that, that there is fentanyl in it. Which is incredible to think how mm -hmm. this has exploded. I mean, we know that mm -hmm. drugs evolve over time, but correct me if I'm wrong, this is coming across the border. It's coming from Mexico, but it's from China is mm -hmm. where most of this is originated. It's, it's synthetic, it's being made, right. and it's being sent to Mexico. The cartels are bringing it up through, and now it's everywhere. And to my knowledge, there are people that don't think that they are ingesting fentanyl, that find fentanyl in things that they think is as benign as weed. They're finding fentanyl. So explain to my audience how people that are maybe having issues with drugs, how do they know that they're not getting their hands on fentanyl or do they have no promise that anything that they are taking is not laced with fentanyl in some capacity? Good point. There is there's no guarantee that what you buy on the street doesn't contain fentanyl and the likelihood that it does contain fentanyl far outweighs that it doesn't. So in cocaine overdose deaths, 50% were attributed to fentanyl being added to the product. With methamphetamines, and these are 21 numbers, uh, with methamphetamines, 75% of those deaths included fentanyl uh, being in the product. So uh, a local doc, a friend of mine has seen, he's got a, a MAT clinic, medicated assisted treatment clinic. He's now seeing people who subscribe to being longtime meth addicts come in and have fentanyl and opioids in their system. It's not because they chose it, it's because it's in the drugs they buy, right? And the, uh, 
there, there happens to be a, um, a shortage of pharmacy quality um, Adderall pills right now, generic and name brand. So what you're seeing is all the Adderall that, that are ending up in end users' hands are actually coming from the cartels in Mexico and they're coming across our borders and you have no idea. They look, the counterfeits look just like they came from a pharmacy. I'm not somebody who would ever buy drugs on the street. <laughs> not something that I would ever be into. Not something I would ever trust anyway. I mean, there are very few things I will buy on the street anyway. I really won't even get a hot dog in New York off the street. I find it disgusting. So that's not something that is in my lifestyle. But there are a lot of people, a lot of young people especially. You brought up Adderall because young people have been using Adderall for many, many years, especially college kids using Adderall to be able to cram for tests and all this. So now is there a concern that fentanyl is in Adderall, especially due to this shortage of pharmacy grade or pharmacy prescribed? I think it, it heightens it. So I've spoken to uh, drug dealers. I've spoken to local law enforcement. I've spoken to DEA, um, all of whom wish to be anonymous. But there is fentanyl in everything. And um, I even know a, a semi-honest drug dealer who stopped selling opioids because he didn't want to get a murder charge, didn't want to get a drug-induced homicide charge. Um, the likelihood that fentanyl is in everything from marijuana or any powder-based drug, so what used to be heroin, what is now cocaine with fentanyl, what is now meth with fentanyl, um, crack is showing signs of it, um, all the way down to every representation of a pharmacy-grade opioid pill or benzodiazepine likely includes fentanyl. So is it cheaper? Is that why they're, they're putting it, using it to cut other drugs and using it to dilute other drugs because... It's cheaper and the cartels are making a lot of money off of it? It's cheaper and it's smaller to ship. So if a brick of cocaine comes here, that's 2.2 pounds of party drug that's gonna get cut five times, now you got 10 pounds. It's likely not gonna kill very many people. So dangerous, yes. Fatal, not as often. A brick of fentanyl, 2.2 pounds, a kilo, is gonna show up here with the, with the uh, likelihood it could kill 500,000 before it's cut. So what do you want? If I'm the cartel, I want more customers. And if I kill a few along the way, okay, cool. But what we're going to see, and this is, this is my prediction over the next two or three years, we're going to see the complete stoppage of pure, pure cocaine, pure meth, pure anything making its way across our borders. Um, and the cartel is also in Canada bringing it down. So it's coming in from the west and coming down from the north. Um, we're surrounded, right? And fentanyl will be in everything. And, you know, it's a, it's a synthetic opioid used medicinally to treat chronic pain or to put you under for a surgery. And, you know, in, in pre- or post-op situations, you're, you can be intubated and your breathing can be controlled. So no more than 50, 75 to 100 titrated up micrograms over time with, you know, qualified nursing and docs around, um, that's safe, right? But what these guys and girls don't understand when they're buying off the street is there's no way to test potency, right? right? And no good drug addict worth their salt is going to test very much of their product, right? And we're seeing it becoming more and more and more of a problem. It's a problem in every city. It's a problem in every state. But what I've noticed as well, because I come from a small state, I come from a rural state, mm -hmm. is that it's a big problem in rural communities as well. It's a big problem in areas that you might not think would have a big drug problem. Normally, when we think of drug problem, we think big cities. We think New York City. We think mm -hmm. Chicago. We think L.A. But this is something that's really stretched across rural, urban. I mean, it is everywhere. What have you seen in, in studying this and the people that are using it and the age demographics that are using it? What patterns are you noticing? So we're seeing, so casual users are turning into full-blown addiction much quicker with the addition of fentanyl. So you've got... Is it more addictive, the fentanyl? than other drugs? Fentanyl is the most addictive, potent, and potentially fatal substance available in America. Wow. And you can buy it for as little as $2. Wow. Yeah. So that's probably a large part of it. I want to talk about the solutions. The border's not going to close anytime soon. Mm -hmm. I think we know that. I mean, maybe in 2024 we might get some traction, but really, who knows? Right. Who knows how much we're going to be able to undo, right? So what is a solution outside of monitoring our border and enforcing it the way we should be doing mm -hmm. to make sure that especially young people who are completely ignorant to all the things you just talked about, how do we reach them? How do we explain this? How do we stop it from what we can control at this time? 
So my new, my new venture, infentanyl.com, we are going to be putting out a lot of content around awareness and education and prevention. Um, you know, if you were gonna run a war on fentanyl like a business, you'd have really two wings. You'd have prevention, which would house education, awareness, content, let's engage kids, but let's also get into schools early age because again, drug use typically comes from a need to medicate feelings. So instead of learning about, um, you know, the English painters in 1200, why don't we do some emotional check-ins to see what's going on at home with our children, right? I think it starts with American children. And, um, you know, you got, if you got prevention on one side and you put treatment on the other, there's your two pillars of what you need to be successful. And I'd love to see harsher penalties um, as part, is considered as part of treatment. Um, I think it should carry no less, uh, if I were to sell, sell someone uh, a fatal amount of, of fentanyl, I think the penalty should be no less than a DUI homicide. Um, you're talking right. about years in prison. Um, but I think part of our prison system should be redirected to, to treating long-term drug addicts. Um, it, it's, it's, we can't out-treat it, we can't out-arrest it, and we, our local law enforcement guys have no chance if the border's not stopped. And you, you brought up the problems that we're experiencing in our communities, but also the homeless population mm -hmm. is being impacted. I lived in LA for several years and I know they are currently having the debate. They've got so many homeless people that are addicted to drugs, a lot of them probably addicted to fentanyl, mm -hmm. right? And these local governments, these state governments, even the federal government is dedicating so much money to housing and getting people off the streets. But I've seen it with my own eyes. If somebody's addicted to something, it doesn't matter if you give them a mansion in Beverly Hills, they are still going to be an addict and they are still going to be a detriment to themselves and to society. So how do we address this situation in a way that's compassionate, but also gives people some consequences? Because you know better than I that People that don't have consequences are able to blame everything else but themselves. They will not stop their addiction. They will not seek help for their addiction because there are no repercussions for having that addiction in their mind until they drop dead. Right. And the thing, the thing around um, stopping an addict mid-addiction cycle is if I don't see value to my life, then why stop, right? And I think we, like on a family level, we want to disrupt the, the, the ease and comfort that someone can use, right? And from a systemic level, I think you have to do the same thing. I think you have to go in here. There's a fentanyl camp I could take you to that we could walk to in five minutes. Go in here and look at all the harm reduction people that are coming in to pass out safe using kits to make it easier for our people to die. My thing is, if your house is on fire, do you want the fire department to show up with kerosene to make it go faster or do you want to show them with water? And I think that's what our, our systems are doing right now. We're showing up with kerosene to let go of people. I think this is almost population control. Well, there's a lot of places that have safe injection uh, sites. Mm -hmm. uh, they're toying with the idea in California. New York already has toyed with that idea. Is You just make it safer for people to shoot up drugs, you'll save lives. But you're telling me that that is a completely backward way of thinking. I think that's an express lane to just get rid of more people. The safe shoot up. Because what they right. would say is that that actually allows them to be supervised. If they're going to be addicted anyway, at least they'll be in a supervised setting and they can get medical attention. I think that's a great more government answer to a problem that starts in childhood. Right. If we're going to put more government in anything, let's put more assistance to children to make sure that they're actually getting what they need emotionally and mentally um, from their home environment. I want to move away from fentanyl now because I know that you work with a number of not only addiction issues, but mental health, depression, mm -hmm. suicide. Something that's been really troubling for me to see is the increasing number of young people who are taking their life. And we know that mentioning throwing gas on the fire, the pandemic threw gas on that fire. Mm -hmm. A lot of people alone with their thoughts, a lot of people in toxic home environments, they didn't have the extracurriculars, they didn't have the community centers. A lot of the things that kept people from experiencing true mental health crises were taken away during COVID. Right. But now we're seeing it, and what's really troubling me, we, we talked about it a couple weekends ago on Fox News, there's a young girl in New Jersey who had the crap beat out of her and it was videoed. And then the video was sent everywhere and people picked on her for it. And she took her own life because of the online harassment and bullying. Now, I know that this is separate from the addiction conversation, but it's still in line with this crisis that we're seeing in our country surrounding mental health and suicide for young people. I know that you run you know, intervention programs. What would you say to parents of teenagers who never think it could happen to their teen, never thought their teen could ever take their life? I would, tell, I would tell every family member that until, if there is an issue in the home or at school, I think you treat 
that young person like an acute psych patient. That means that suicide is never off the table and precautions need to be taken, right? We need to get a 360 on every young person with emotional check-ins and we call it um, eagle eye. So if there's a person we're concerned about, we never take our eyes off of them. And that should happen in the home, that should happen in the schools. And, and there are some great adolescent programs out there, but you know they're cost prohibitive to a lot of Americans. Going back to the solutions between addiction crisis and mental health and suicide, depression, all of it that we're seeing, especially in our young people, is there a way to message this better to young people? Is there a way to reach them in a better way to make it make more sense to them or make it something that they're willing to listen to? Because I've been a high schooler once. I know listening to the programs on on drugs and mental health and this, that, and the other. I mean, they kind of just tune out. Unless mm -hmm. it's on TikTok or unless their friends are talking about it, we're not getting their attention. Right. I wonder how we do that in a more effective way. I think, I think it starts with engaging early. And you don't, I don't think you can make recovery cool for kids because nobody's going to buy that. But I think you can make the approach cooler and more amenable to young, young children. And what starts young can grow, right? I think, I think that we have to get really creative as leaders to make sure that, that kids know that, that the dangers of smoking pot like mom and dad or their cool uncle did, those dangers have exponentially grown over, over time. Um, there's fentanyl everywhere. Um, the risk of long-term psychosis or depression, suicidality, they're everywhere. And everything we need to do needs to be, if I'm at point A, I wanna go to point B, I want every step to take me closer. We need to be mindful that we, we've got to ensure our young people's mental health. And that's really key because a lot of the addiction stems from the mental health problems. Mm -hmm. And people not paying attention so much anymore in this country. I mean, nothing breaks my heart more than to see parents on their phones with young kids on their phones. Everybody's plugged into their phones but not really plugged into each other. You mentioned nfentanylnow.com. Did I get that correct? That is. So what, uh, where can they go and what else, what other resources will my audience get from you to maybe help them in their own life? So infentanylnow.com is, is up and running right now. We will have content coming to, to how to spot overdose, how to spot use, what to do in case of either, who to call, when to take action. We want this to be a no-brainer. Um, at the end of the day, I want Narcan in every school system, in every public place, wherever, there's a, wherever there is a fire extinguisher. I want trained staff in every school, in every public place, to know what to do in case of overdose. And just real quickly, because now I'm curious, how do you spot fentanyl use in somebody? What are the warning signs of that? Fentanyl use in, in most Americans is going to look like, if it's, if it's potent, you'll see them nod off, come in and out of a conversation, or in and out of sleep. Deep, deep labored breathing is a, is a call sign as well. Um, slurred speech, um, dilated or undilated pupils, bloodshot eyes. You can typically tell when someone's been using long-term uh, by their physical appearance. They're going to appear gaunt. They're going to appear disinterested in food. Um, they're going to be malnourished, and they're typically going to be uh, not hydrated or interested at all in any, any food or water. Can you be a functioning fentanyl user, like you can be a functional alcoholic? I don't believe so. I know plenty of happy, otherwise healthy, functional alcoholics that make it to work. They're great moms and dads. Um, you know, they, they carry on their, their board position at the church or the bank. Um, I don't think there is ever going to be a casual fentanyl user. Um, if that person exists, they're a unicorn. Right. And we shouldn't want that anyway. That's not something we should wish for. Right. So let's end fentanyl now. Darren, thank you so much for being with me and for all that you do for Nashville and all that you do across the country to help people with these really, really important conversations and problems in their life and their family. And I hope to see you back really soon. Awesome. Thank you for having me.